Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Glad y'all are here. Uh, I want to say welcome to First North as well. So today we're starting a new series called Answers to Life-Changing Questions. And so I want to start by telling you a story of a question that I was asked that did change the direction of my life. So I wrote my now father-in-law, I wrote him a letter before Shay and I were married. And I said, hey, I'd like to sit down and talk with you about the prospect of marrying Shay. And so I gave him that letter, and the next day he called. I can't remember how we got in touch, but he said, hey, why don't you come by about 30 minutes early uh, this Friday before Shay gets home, and I know y'all are going to do something. I said, sure, no problem. So I go to the house, and you walk into the house, and to the right is their kitchen, and then they had like a little green area, you know, um, sort of the outdoor porch kind of thing. And so I walk in there, and he knows I'm coming, remember, remember that. He's sitting at a table cleaning his nine millimeter and his Glock. <laughs> he knows I'm coming and he knows why I'm coming. And so I was immediately understood like, okay, I see how this is going to go. I see how this relationship is going to go from here moving forward. But as we sat and talked, he understood my intentions and what I was there for. But then he asked me a question. It was a simple question, but a profound and, and very important question. He simply just looked at me and he said, what's your plan? And then he just, he didn't say anything else. And I said, what do you mean? He said, what's your plan? Shay's got ambitions, what's your plan? And that was a question that caused me to look inwards and I had to think for a moment like, do I have a plan? Do I have a plan of what, what our future is going to look like? Do I have a plan of how to be a good husband or at least how, maybe how to learn how to be a good husband? Do I have a plan of how I'm gonna provide for her so that she can see her, her ambitions and dreams come to fruition? What is your plan? Questions have a way of opening us up. And so questions, they're like keys to the door of our souls that open us up. And they open us up to the deepest parts of our lives. And it's fascinating to see what questions can do. Even in that moment with my father-in-law, if he had simply looked at me and made a statement like, make sure you have a plan, I would have replied, no problem, I do. When I didn't really, but when he asked the question just out of curiosity and just being curious, what is your plan? It caused me to think for a moment and, and look and, and realize something about myself that I was unaware of at the time. I like what one writer says when it comes to this idea of questions. He says, we are closer to God when we are asking questions rather than when we think we have all the answers. Jesus asked questions to help us know ourselves and know him. Jesus was a question asker. So rabbis, which is what Jesus is, is we're going to look here in John chapter 1. He's going to be called rabbi. It's a religious teacher of the day. Rabbis were known for asking questions, not so they could learn new information, but so they could help the person that they were talking with see something that the person could not yet see. And so this is what Jesus does. And Jesus, throughout the Gospels, he asks all kinds of questions. And they're always to say, Jesus is asking something because he sees something and he says, look, you need to know yourself. Because when we know ourselves, we know God more deeply. And as we know God more deeply, we also know ourselves. And we understand the relationship that we have for God. The two work together. Understanding God helps us understand self. Understanding self helps us understand God and his grace and mercy. And the two come together to form a strong relationship. And it's amazing, it's amazing when you read the Gospels and you read how Jesus does this, you learn very quickly that it's amazing how the right question at the right time by the right person with the right posture can completely alter the direction of someone's life. And that's what Jesus set out to do. And Jesus, he's often thought of as the answer. And he absolutely is, one of, don't wanna minimize that at all. He is the answer. But oftentimes, we might not be asking the right question because we tend to focus a little bit on the here and now. And so we tend to ask and, and think the most important questions are maybe some things like this. Will this new job make more money than my last job? Do we have enough money? Can we live in the bigger house? Can I get the bigger truck or the bigger whatever? Can, when is my next vacation? Because I just need a break. When is my next vacation? When will I get back to my hobbies, back to the deer lease, back to the golf course, back to the river, back to whatever it may be? How can I hide my past? Will I be single forever? Will my marriage ever turn this corner that I hope and want it to turn? And those are 
okay questions, but Jesus asks very deeply and profound questions to help us learn something about ourselves. And Jesus always knew how to ask the right question at the right time to the right person with the right posture to get people to see something that they could not see otherwise. And so he asks questions because he loves people. He wants to know people. So we're going to look at the next six weeks, six questions that Jesus asked that pertain to our lives today. And they pertain to things that we think about today because they are ways when he asks these questions around these topics, they just open something up inside of us that maybe we hadn't seen before. So today we're going to talk about purpose. Next week we're going to talk about worry and anxiety and stress and the question Jesus asks. Third week we're going to talk about anger and how to uncontrolled anger and what's going on in that situation. The fourth week, a month from now, we're going to talk about how do you deal with loss and grief. How do you deal with that? Jesus asks a very profound question in one moment to help a family deal with that. Next is, uh, how do you deal with relationships and maybe even the blame game in relationships? And then finally, the question about how do we trust God and live wisely in today's world? He asks questions about all six of these ideas. And so the first one we're going to start with today is in John 138, what are you seeking? Or you could look at it and say, what are you looking for? So in John 138, two disciples come to follow Jesus, and it's Andrew. We learn later that it's Andrew and an unnamed disciple. And so then Jesus turns and he sees them, and again it says right here in John 138, he said to them, what are you seeking? He turns and he asks them a very profound question. What are you looking for? Now, if you were to go to a department store, maybe you did here recently, and the, just a clerk or someone walked up to you and said, what are you looking for? That's not a big deal. You're just, I, I'm looking for the boys' department because I need to buy new school clothes for my son. So that, that question doesn't carry much weight. But when the right person asks you that question, what are you looking for? There's a profound sense of weight to it. And these two men that he asked this question to, they, they kind of were understood this, this might be more than a man that we're about to follow here. Because their former rabbi, John the Baptist, who was very clear about his purpose, which was to pave the way for the one to come after him, when he saw Jesus, he told these two disciples, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I can kind of just imagine because John says, like, I must decrease, he must increase. John even maybe encouraged these guys, you need to leave me and go follow him. Behold the Lamb of God. So a man that you trust, that you believe his words, has now told you this is the Messiah. And now the Messiah looks at you and says, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you want? What are you seeking That's a question that carries a profound sense of weight for us. And he's looking at them and he's saying, are you making the decisions? Are you making the decisions that are going to move you along the life and get you to the destination and place that you hope it will get? Are you making those decisions? What is it that you are looking for? And his question opens them up to begin to ask, what are we looking for? Because what we learn from Jesus and what we see in the Bible is that there is a profound difference between just staying alive and having something to live for. A profound and almost, I would say, an eternal difference between just staying alive and having something to live for. And here's what purpose does. Purpose creates something for us. It creates a destination to sacrifice for. It creates a legacy to live for and daily meaning to strive for. Purpose is what motivates us to move and go each and every single day. It's what lives deeply inside of us. What are you seeking? Another way you could ask this question in a pretty profound way, what are you doing with your one and only life God has given you? Backing up in this story here in John chapter 1. So as I've already said, John the Baptist knows he's not the Messiah, but he knows he's paving the way for the Messiah. And so when all of this comes down, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, those two disciples begin to follow him, which leads all up. So you understand they've got all this stuff going on in their mind and heart. Okay, this is the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Messiah, according to our former rabbi. And then they come, and it says in verse 37, the two disciples heard John say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him. Now let's just stop there. Notice what Jesus does there. He turns towards them. That might not seem like a big deal, but but let me help you understand what's happening. In this day, only the best of the best 
from Hebrew school and Torah school were able to follow a rabbi. And they had to be invited to follow that rabbi. So throughout the school age years, you know, as they, as they began to see, okay, maybe you're, you're not as, as good as this group, they would wean those out and they would send them back home and say, okay, you're going to go home and follow your, your father's trade. And just that's going to be your life. But the best of the best moved along and they were invited at the end of that by a rabbi to come and follow me. And so these guys are followers of Jesus, and, or excuse me, followers of John. And he, when Jesus turns and looks at them, remember, they haven't been invited. Not yet. And they can imagine their thoughts. What are you seeking? When he turns and sees them, he does, it's not just a glance, just sort of like, yeah, yeah, what do you guys want? That's not how Jesus operates. When the Bible says that he saw them, it means that he looked deeply and intently at them and knew them in that moment. He knows what it is that they're looking for. He knows. He understands something about them. He observed them carefully. And he saw something in themselves that perhaps they had not seen. And this is what Jesus does with his questions. Jesus leads me to see what he sees in me. He doesn't ask questions to learn information. He asks questions to help me see what he already knows. Reminds me of the, when I was a kid, my parents had two foster sons for a season of mine and my brother's life. So at one point, we had two foster brothers. And for about three or four years, they lived with us. One particular evening, right after Halloween, one of those boys got into the Halloween candy, and we were always supposed to ask. We could, if we could have it as long as we asked. And so he didn't ask. He just got into it and got a few pieces and ate it, went, snuck to the bathroom and ate it, and then hid the, the wrappers in like a bedpost, garbage can type thing, where hopefully nobody would find it. Well, my dad found it. And so my dad sat the four of us down, and he said, which one of you, which one ate the candy? And of course, nobody fessed up. It's like, no, he did it. Oh, he did it. No, he did it. I think he did it. And so my dad said, okay, y'all talk for a few minutes, and I'll come back and check on you. And so we did, and as we talked, it was all accusation. Oh, you did it, you did it, you did it, you did it. And my dad comes back, and after a while, finally, one of my foster brothers said, I'm the one who did it. And my dad looked at us, and he said, I already knew which one of you did it. I already knew. But here's what I want you to see. It's important that you be honest, even when you know you've done something wrong. It's important that you be honest. You see, his question, he could have just come and said, look, I know which one of you did this, and here's the punishment. But the question, who did this? It caused us to see something, and it caused us an opportunity for us to see. It's important to be honest, even when we know we've done something wrong. And so it continues on. This is what Jesus does. He helps us see something inside of ourselves that we would not see otherwise. What are you seeking there in John 1.38? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now their question, where are you staying? That's not, what, where's your house? There's a little bit deeper meaning here. And the, the writer John, who wrote the Gospel of John, if you go into the original language, he's setting up this idea of abiding with Jesus. Because this idea of where are you staying, you could also translate it, where are you abiding? And so he's already setting up this idea that it's important that we abide with Jesus because abiding with Jesus, meaning being at home and at peace and following Jesus, it provides a stability from which we can live out our purpose that otherwise we would not have in any other way. And that's what they're looking, well, what are you seeking? They want a place to abide, they want a stability. And Jesus, he would pick up on this theme and he would begin to teach it in John chapter 15, verse five. He says, listen, you must abide in me and I in you because apart from me, you can do nothing. So essentially they're saying, when they say rabbi, it's rabbi, take us under your wing, provide shelter for us, and in a world that we can't make sense of, help us to make sense of it. And there's a, a Jewish story told, and I've read it in several different books now, so I, I think it's true at this point, several different sources. But there's a, a story told that when you follow a rabbi, you were supposed to follow him so closely that you were to be what they called covered in the dust. And what they meant was rabbis in this day, they walked, of course, everywhere they went. And this was dirt roads. And so as they walked on those dirt roads, that dust would get stirred up behind them and the picture was you were supposed to follow your rabbi so closely that the dust he kicks up as he's walking gets onto you. The, the picture there is that the way he lives and what he teaches, it should be all over you. 
And so they're asking, they're basically saying, Rabbi, let us be covered in your dust. Because Jesus is the only stability that they are looking for. They were hungry for something. They were hungry. Jesus said, what are you seeking? They were hungry for purpose. They were hungry for meaning. They were hungry to know who it was that they were going to follow. And essentially, Jesus is asking them to, to think about who am I? Why am I alive? There's a story told of a wealthy man who got lost in the woods. And he found this path. And he walked along this path until he came to this camp that he was unaware of and didn't know where it was and was trying to figure out and decipher his way back. And out of nowhere, a guard shouted him, who are you and what are you doing here? And this wealthy man turns to him and looks at him and says, how much do they pay you to guard this place? And the guy says, why do you want to know? He says, because I will pay you double every single day if you will follow me around and ask me those two questions every day. Who are you? What are you here for? Friends, who are you? What are you here for? How do we find and fulfill our purposes in life? We always face them because this idea of who are you, what are you here for, it doesn't know an age discrimination. Every single one of us, whether you're young or further along in life, all of us are asking this question. So when, you, when we're in a younger years, students, we face it as, as they begin to find freedom during their later high school years. What is going to be my life's direction? Young adults feel it as they look out into the world and think, I could hypothetically do almost whatever it is that I want, but what should I do? And in this, this time where it feels like I'm waiting between school and maybe life to start, what does that look like? What should I do in that moment? Adulthood, which is where we spend a, a vast majority of our lives, we're asking, well, what should I do? It reminds me of when I was in a, sitting in a small group, one of my friends said, I refuse to accept the reality or the belief that my life consists of waking up every single day, going to a job that frustrates me, that drains life out of me, and that angers me at times just so I can pay for stuff that's going to eventually break and I got to fix. And it's just a perpetual cycle of going on and on and on. What are, you, what are you here for? What are you doing? Well, I'm working a job to buy the stuff that I've got. And then well, why do you need that stuff? Why do you have? I got to go to work to pay these bills. Why do you have those bills? Why not different ones? Why did you choose that house? Why did you choose that life? What are we here for? And then later in life, we begin to ask, what does life add up to? What is my legacy going to be? Bob Goff wrote a book called Love Does, and he wrote a profound statement. He says this, I used to be afraid of failing at something that really mattered to me, but now I'm more afraid at succeeding at things that don't matter. Are you good at the things that don't ultimately matter? See, what are you here for? Who are you and what are you here for? Or as to ask as Jesus did, what are you seeking? It continues on after they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying or saw where he was abiding and they abode or abided, however you say that, stayed with him for that day for it was the 10th hour. So on the one hand, yes, they wanted to know, hey, where are you staying the night? But notice that there's something profound that happens here. Jesus says, come and you will see. And we know that they begin to learn this phrase from Jesus, this invitation. Because even the next day, one of them goes and finds his brother. Andrew goes and finds his brother and says, come and see. Or Philip goes and talks to Nathaniel, come and see. We have found the one who is the Messiah. Come and see. Come and see. This is what Jesus does. And they come to him about at the 10th hour, which is 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So they get to the house at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. They stay with Jesus all evening, talking, having conversations. They wake up the next day, and Andrew says, it says that Andrew went and found his brother, Simon Peter, who is the Simon Peter, and says, we have found the Messiah. It's not recorded, but man, I would love to know what that conversation was like, right? From 4 in the afternoon until whenever, it's like they decided this guy is the Messiah. What did that conversation look like? When we get to heaven one day, maybe we'll get to ask Andrew, what did y'all talk about all night that convinced you so much? He is the Messiah. He is the one that we need to live for. Which brings us to the point is Jesus gives purpose by first calling us to himself. Purpose is a response of devotion to Jesus. To know your calling, to know your purpose You've got to first know the caller and the purpose giver. 
Without a call, without someone who calls us and without a purpose giver, there is no calling, there is no purpose to life. Life becomes just a series of events with no meaning in them whatsoever. And we're just consistently, perpetually moving, going where, who knows. But when you have a, a caller and a purpose giver in Jesus, life begins to take on much more meaning, value, and purpose. But remember, Jesus, he first calls us to himself. And then purpose comes out of that relationship with Jesus. So it's devotion to Jesus first and then direction from Jesus next. And we can't flip those two. We've got to be devoted to him. He's called us to be with him. Just like we follow the, they would follow their rabbi and get the dust of him on there. We've got to look like Jesus and we've got to have the dust of Jesus, so to speak, on our lives by following him each and every day. And as we follow him and as we're devoted to him, direction from him comes into our lives, which gives us meaning, value, and ultimately purpose. And so Jesus says, come and follow me. Now, I love how he says that. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't turn around and say, okay, what are you seeking? And they say, Rabbi, tell us what you're saying. He doesn't launch into an interview. He doesn't launch into say, okay, well, tell me your credentials. Let's see if you're worthy enough to follow me. Well, how did you do, how did you do in Hebrew school? How did you do in Torah school? Do you know the Old Testament? Have you memorized the entire Old Testament? The best of the best have done that. Have you done that? He does none of that. He looks at them and says, come on, follow me. There is no limitation to who Jesus invites friends. There is no limitation in this room to anyone. Jesus wants each and every one of you to hear that same invitation. Come, follow me. It's not a limiting factor. It's not your past. It's not what you've done. It's not what you can do. It's simply will you come and follow me. The only, the only prerequisite to following Jesus, there's just simply one. But sadly, so many of us refuse to admit that we have this. The only thing you need to follow Jesus is need. But sadly, so many of us won't come to the place where we admit, I need him. And so we miss out. But Jesus is for each and every one of you, come and follow me. Because ultimately, with our one and only life, we are made for one purpose, and here's what it is, to glorify God by loving God and loving others. Now, we live this out a myriad of different ways, and so there's one overarching purpose and then underneath that, there's secondary purposes that we are called to, to live this out. Jesus himself said it in Matthew 22. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The entire Old Testament hangs on those two ideas. Love God, love other people. The Apostle Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I love that he says whether you eat or drink. So we can, hey, look, in our culture, we love to eat. Let's eat to the glory of God. Amen? Boudin to the glory of God. <clears throat> what does the glory of God mean? Because that's, that's often, it feels like this idea of like, okay, well, but what does that mean, this glory of God? Let me take you sort of to understand this to Isaiah, the book, Old Testament book of Isaiah, who's a prophet to the nation of Israel. And in Isaiah chapter 6, he has this vision of God where God brings him into the throne room. And he sees this mighty, powerful vision. And it, it wrecks his life in the most wonderful, beautiful way. In that vision, a group of angels shout over Isaiah and over the Lord, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that word glory there means weight or weightiness or heaviness. So essentially the word glory, what it means is that it sits down on us and it has a weight to it. So kind of the way you could think about it is long time ago, maybe back in the 70s or so, if something happened that really impacted your life, you might say something like, whoa, that was heavy. For those of you who were there, and maybe I got it wrong, I don't know. But either way, Man, that's heavy. Like you feel it. Like it impacts you in a certain way. That's what the glory means. The whole earth is full of the weight of God's glory sitting in upon our lives, impacting our lives, making a difference in our lives. That's what the glory of God is all about. That I can look at my life and see what I once was, that old man who is now gone. I am a new creation in Christ, putting my faith in Jesus. That's the glory of God coming into my life, changing me, giving me a devotion to him and a direction from him. That's what Jesus calls us to. There's three things to consider then 
three things. I want to give you three things to consider when you're asking, okay, what is it that I'm here for? What is it that I'm seeking? Why am I here? And so each one of these is important. And so the first one is God's glory. The first one is God's glory. So purpose starts with God's glory and a full relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Friends, if you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, then you have no purpose because you don't know the purpose giver. And so it all starts God's glory at the cross where I give my life to Jesus Christ. And I put my faith in him. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus and I call upon his name. So God's glory through this relationship that I have with him is where purpose begins. There's a second thing that happens when you're saved and the Holy Spirit begins uh, to indwell you. He comes and he gifts you with certain what we call spiritual gifts. And he gives each and every person who is a follower of Jesus, you have a gift. Every single one of you if, you, if you say, I follow Jesus, he is my Lord, he is my Savior, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and you have a gifting from him, what we call a spiritual gift. And so you need to think about, when you think about your purpose, what is my spiritual gift? Do I know it? Do I know my gifting? Because your gifting is how God's going to use you, and that's part of your purpose. So if you're not sure what your spiritual gift is, let me offer you um, a practical way you can figure that out. We offer what we call a growth track where you can come and sit down with uh, Pastor John and, and do a survey, and you can figure out what is it that my spiritual gifts are. And then one of the best ways you sort of confirm what your gifts are is you begin to exercise them. They're like muscles. The more you use them, the stronger they get. But then there's a third part to purpose that God gives to us, and it has to do with people around us and their needs in life their needs. Your purpose will meet people's needs because God is passionate that we glorify him by loving him and by loving other people. And so I would ask you to consider who is it that around me who has needs? What are their needs? Now it's important that all three of these are together because there's some dangers if we only try to get two of them. You might think, well, two of them, that's 66%. That's pretty good. But there's dangers. So if all I don't know about is God's glory and people's needs, but I don't know my spiritual gifts, friends, no matter how hard we try, you're going to end up frustrated. You're going to end up frustrated. Because you see the need and you want to glorify God, but yet you, you don't know your gifts and how to do it. And so you're going to try, 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 and push, 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 and yet the whole time you're operating outside of your gifting of the Holy Spirit. You're trying to do it in your own power, and it won't work. It's all frustration. Another danger area. You could say, well, yeah, I know my spiritual gift, and I work really hard to meet people's needs. It sounds, it sounds wonderful, but if you exclude God's glory, pride is going to be the result. Because eventually what's going to happen, no matter, you, you exercise this gift and it gets stronger and stronger, and it will, and you begin to meet people's needs, not far behind, without God's glory, you're going to be think, I'm pretty good. I'm getting good at this. All the while forgetting it's only God who gave you the gift in the first place. The only reason you could do anything is because of his glory. Now, the third one, and I end with this one because this one I think is the most dangerous because this one is the one that hides the best. And we need to be very vigilant and cognizant about it in our own individual lives and also in our church. And that is only focusing on God's glory and our gifts. You might think, well, that sounds pretty good. What's the result? Legalism. That's the result. If all I worry about is God's glory and how I exercise my gifts and I never love other people, legalism. And friends, legalism ultimately descends into hypocrisy. And we must always be vigilant towards that. Am I, am I focused on loving others as well? Taking God's glory and how he's gifted me and using it to help other people. And consistently seeking, how has God purposed my life? What are you seeking? What are you here for? Now, I want to encourage you to wrap, as we wrap things up, 
The reason that you and I can seek anything as far as purpose goes in our lives is because we were sought first. Let me remind you how this, this chapter of John chapter 1 where Jesus asks, what are you seeking? Let me take you all the way back to the very beginning of it where the Bible says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then you move down to verse 14 of John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory is as, as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. The reason that we can seek is because we were sought. God, if there was, there was this gap between us, and it could only be bridged by God's actions. And so what did he do? Jesus came. And he's seeking each and every one of you. What am I seeking? What am I here for? Os Guinness, who said this, isn't that a cool name? I, I, I said that in first service, they didn't get it. Do y'all get it? It's, it's just amazing. His name is Os. All right. Here's what he says. He's a great writer. He says, the secret of seeking is not in our human ascent to God, but in God's descent to us. We start out searching, but we end up uh, being discovered. Start out searching and realize, as I said a moment ago, you've been sought the whole time. And Jesus came to do that for you. What are you seeking? Seek the face of Jesus and he will give you direction. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word and what it does in our lives. And God, I pray you would meet each and every one of us, wherever we are on this question of what are we seeking? What is our purpose? God, I pray you would meet us right there in the middle of that, each and every individual here. Jesus, I know that you've invited every single one of us to come and follow you and to see what you want to do in our lives. And so, Father, we're grateful. We're grateful that you sought us out. And grateful that you send us out. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.